Good morning, everyone. So it's the weekend, Ooh, Saturday. I hope you're having a big one. And if you're in Australia or that part of the world, I hope your uh, Saturday's been pretty cool. Um, this uh, tracker image is all those colours is actually the temperature. So things are getting very hot up the front for lots of reasons. One, the temperature is about 30 degrees average, and um, there's a lot of interplay between who's going to be uh, first across the doldrums. Anyway, but uh, we'll get back to that shortly. And in the meantime, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, it's surprising the number of questions I get asked about different subjects. So I'm going to walk you through the website again, okay, and show you some interesting stuff. It's a weekend, so we can, uh, as I say, waffle on a bit. But anyway, I'll uh, come back to the um, come back to the website. So the first thing I want to show you, we get uh, questions uh, asked about uh, 2018 edition of the GGR. You know, it's all on the website. The whole history of the 2018 is here. Um, I'll just come straight to uh, along the top bar here. Okay, that's the first part. You come to the race. Just click on that and you can see you've got 2026. So if you're interested in the race, you can see the latest news on 26. But underneath it, it says 2018 GGR. So if you hit that, okay, uh, you come straight back to everything that happened in 2018, right? There's a bit of a quick overview. That's the team we had then, Jane and I and Dave and, uh, you know, Celine and, uh, you know, Christoph and uh, everyone's there. Some of the things we were doing, but the fun part is, so that was the team in their survival suits before they uh, uh, took off. My favourite photo of Jean-Luc and um, Sir Robin and myself having fun in the office at the end. Uh, you've got a timeline here, very similar to our summary uh, on the top. So you can hit on any of these and just scroll it along. And you've got the whole quick summary of the actual race, you know, everything that happened all, all the way along. You can just get quick grabs and say, oh, what happened on the 20th of August? Oh, southern ice limit raised. So we lifted the ice limit and um, 23rd of August. So you want a quick overview of the race. That's where you hit that. You come down, you've got all the skipper profiles. There's good old Tapio again. He was there 2018. You can click on to that and you will actually get, um, you know, all the information. But here's the other fun part. You've got the whole tracker, okay? So you can actually play with the 2018 tracker. You can use the video replay at the bottom and I'll do a video replay on the current edition, the current tracker today when I finish with the bit. So I'll just remind you how to get to the, the video replay and you can actually uh, go through and uh, follow the whole race, okay? Uh, there's the boats leaving, you know, and uh, you can get their times. They went around Cape Horn. And it helps you to understand the ETAs that I develop for the fleet currently now. Because if you replay it and then play, say, Jean-Luc and uh, uh, Mark Slats and Uku from the equator back to Le Sable de Lone, you'll see it took them about 30, 31 days or so on. And that's how I come up with uh, uh, the current boats are going to arrive somewhere around the end of... Um, end of April, that last week of April, or even late April, it just depends. Okay, so that's the 2018 edition of the race. There's the forum there. If you want to start a discussion, uh, you can get onto the forum um, and do bits and pieces. There's links there and uh, all sorts of bits and pieces, rules sailing. Anyway, coming back to the, um, the main game here on the first page, I think you all know, you come down, scroll down, you follow the race. Here's the main bits and pieces. Someone was asking about the summary highlights. This is really good if you haven't seen it. Again, this, this details the whole race in quick fashion. It just highlights the, the key things that happen, you know, storms in the Bay of Biscay, uh, Damien having to return with his, with his mounts. The whole race is there all the way through. Uh, September, you know, Damien retires, Lanzarote, Mark Sinclair's out. Um, so you can get a quick catch up of what's going on. And this is where we started from because someone mentioned um, certainly Rob uh, over in the UK, he's our digital manager, does all our photography, all our video stuff uh, and all our web stuff. We've been keeping him really busy of late. And if we go right down to today, uh, the last um, update was the 20th of March. So we're still five days behind. Usually it's pretty good, but I've had him doing all sorts of things for us at the moment. So uh, uh, we're just a couple of days behind on that. Okay, so uh, anyway, we'll come back to uh, uh, come back to live uh, here. We've got the tracker coming up, and uh, uh, we'll be into the usual bits and pieces. But anyway, there's lots of information on the website which you can play around with. Okay, uh, so we come here, we put the wind on again, and uh, I'll come back down here to Ian. Um, we'll look at the leaderboard before we do because that's getting quite interesting. I'm surprised it uh, says things that don't appear to be apparent when you look at the tracker. So right now, Kirsten's done 3,000 or got 3,071 nautical miles to the finish. Okay, she's done 28 nautical miles in the last 
24 hours, so she's been doing an average of a bit over one knot, uh, not so good. Uh, Abolish has been doing something similar. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, he, uh, he's been doing um, eight nautical miles in the last 24 hours, so not so good. And he's 3,390 miles to the finish, so near enough to 300 miles technically behind Kirsten. Googs 4,000 and 4,500 effectively to the finish. Did a 99-mile day, which is not too bad. And Ian's anchored up, of course. And when we look at uh, Chichester class to see where Simon is, Simon's on 3,370, oh, nearly exactly the same as Kirsten, uh, less 300 miles. So uh, he's 300 miles behind Kirsten and um, very close to Abolish. Uh, so all interesting. Jeremy, uh, 5,785 nautical miles to go. And uh, Simon did 85 miles in the day, uh, last 24 hours. So you can see uh, 85 compared to, to 24 that, or 28 that Kirsten did, about 60 miles, which is what I said yesterday. I thought he would take out at least 60 miles. So um, that's kind of interesting. The other thing I do, someone asking, I hadn't brought up currents very much of late. Normally, there's not a lot of currents associated with what's going on here. It's generally in the same direction, but there are little interplays there. So um, I'll... Uh, uh, have a look at that when we get into details of the people and what's going on. So for now, I'll come back to wind and we'll who's happily at anchor. Um, and uh, the big question is, will he make the prize giving at the end of June? <laughs> that's the that's the question that we uh, we had a we had a corporate dinner last night. Lutz and Seb and I and uh, uh, Georgie went out to dinner. Uh, Ada's up in the other side of Paris at the moment and Jane's still in China so it was just us and we spoke about all sorts of things so you can see him there tucked up behind the uh, behind the island there um, heaps of wind down here so uh, he's in a, an absolute weather shadow here which is all the high mountains and this is like a fjord here got massively high mountains uh, in various parts which protects it so the breeze is both sides of the the land there and Ian's getting virtually nothing you know there's probably five knots in here and if we zoom in you can actually I think most of you know you can zoom right in you go down to pictures when you get there you can see uh, he's actually um, tucked up in this bay now it's still dark there I'm sure when it's when the dark when the light comes back he'll take off he's only about 15 miles uh, he's about 15 miles from Porter Williams uh, that'll be motoring distance. He's motored yesterday uh, to get in before dark, I'm assuming there. So, um, and he's only going up here. He's going up here to Porter Williams. So 15 miles out, and then we'll put him back on. We'll slow his tracker down. It's still on one hourly at the moment. Um, and uh, he'd be happy to be there for sure. Uh, come on, the wind could track back in there so yes yeah, so not a lot to talk about there jade is looking after him uh, got a lot of local help too i can't tell you all the names but um, there's been a real network there's quite a few followers down there in in that part of the world even there's a yachting fraternity in ushuaia and um, in chile and brazil so they've been calling their mates and all sorts of things so i think ian's got more than enough uh, you know close contacts for when he's up there and jade's doing a good job of uh, organizing logistics um so oh wrong way so now we'll uh, come straight on to uh, Captain Gug. Oh, no, Jeremy. Uh, we'll come up here. Okay, so Jeremy's uh, been doing 2.7 knots at the moment. Uh, the last four hours did 70 nautical miles in the day. This The centre of this uh, high came across him, so that was influence his sailing. And now uh, let's just have a look. At, that'll determine what's going on. He's got a, a, a north, no, it's, a, it's nearly a, it's a, a north, northeasterly. He's going to get so he'll just take off on on uh, port tack he'll keep coming out here but he's got a breeze that's the good thing so he's not going to be wallowing around or anything and um here we go through the first 24 hours yeah there's plenty of breeze there it goes across to the north northwesterly depends on where he is but uh generally a northerly so he'll take off in a northeasterly direction um and then it's sort of oh well it's twisting around doing silly things here but that's basically 24 hours ahead so 24 hours ahead he's got a mixed bag um and then it's generally uh coming up from the south <laughs> so he's on the other side of this one here unfortunately the sea state won't be anything too dramatic but it's still plenty of breeze it's going to be uh, a bit messy for him it's moving around so he'll have his work cut out while he's sailing you know it's not simple it's not all consistent and that's going to move hopefully that moves in front of him yeah so he shouldn't intake this is second day 
he should miss that because once it goes south, it'll, you know, he'll start heading north. So he'll be on the back edge of this. So not a drama. These are the dangerous areas here. It, once it starts developing, you know, when you get a sudden wind shift, uh, the waves get all over the place, and that's when you're really not in a in a pleasant situation. Anyway, the next couple of days, he's uh, he's looking pretty cool. That's 20, 48 hours ahead, and then it's moving away, and he should hopefully hook into this southerly and just keep rocketing up north. So uh, Jeremy's looking pretty good, pretty reasonable. Um, Captain Goog, uh, 2.3 knots and a 99-mile day. That's not too bad. Uh, it's an average of four knots in 24 hours. So, um, so as we suggested yesterday, he was getting a mixed bag, but uh, he's managed to keep moving. And let's see what happens as his timeline goes forward. I'm just clicking it through now. And it's holding pretty much the same. So uh, just looking at that, he's got a, yeah, he's basically, he's going to reach now. This is only uh, in the next 12 hours or so. He's officially, if we uh, look at this, if I scale back, he's officially into the, uh, into the trades now. The trades now aren't very wide. You know, sometimes they come right down here. Um, and this is meant to be a sort of a southeasterly, but it's actually coming from the east, but he'll be happy with that. So officially he's in now. He's, he picks up on the trade winds, and he'll just start rocketing up north until he hits the, the doldrums. And if we pace that out for him to give you a distance, let's make up a bit bigger, and he's probably about a 1,000 thousand miles, um, maybe a 1,000 miles behind. Yeah, there's 1,060, so from the front runners. He's about 1,200 miles. He's been holding that situation for the last couple of weeks. He's been keeping up effectively. So he's still only 1,200 miles behind. That's, uh, uh, what's that? Uh, that's a week and a half sailing distance normally. So um, he's still doing pretty well. Um, we'll uh, but he, one thing's for sure, he's now going to be in the trades and the weekly conversations can get very boring. We had a bit happening there's things to talk about and blah blah and you can't stop him from talking because he loves talking but when it gets in the trades and no one's doing anything it's like what do we talk about now it's quite funny uh, i don't know how many people are listening to the, the conversations but it's it can be quite fun um so Gug and i had a bit of that um, uh, in the last call anyway but that's not bad you know 1200 miles um, behind the leaders after that whole distance so um, all is looking pretty cool uh, oh, we didn't, yeah, no need to really follow him through. I can tell you now everything for the weather for him now is going to be this this uh, this little trade wind, but I better do it. Someone will complain. I missed out a little bit on Abolish yesterday. I didn't give a full explanation and someone mentioned, oh, what happened to Abolish? Um, so, yeah, you can see going forward, it's just an easterly airflow. That's the trades. That's exactly what the guys wanted when they came down before, guys and girls, of course. Um, but they didn't have it that way. They had a southeasterly, which is more on the nose. Now they want to go north. Uh, they want it southeasterly behind them and go boom. But it's been pretty much easterly. Uh, though no complaints. Simon did pretty well. Uh, so that's it for Goog. Come back here. And now, oh, doldrums. This is really quite shocking So in some ways. But that's the name of the game. You know, when you're sailing around the world, you've got to get through the doldrums. Uh, Kirsten has picked up speed a little bit. She's doing 1.7 knots now. And I can't really forecast anything because it's too hard in local weather. But what I can say, if we look at Abolish, he's done 1.3, uh, but facing the wrong way. Uh, he did eight nautical miles in 24 hours, so he's lucked out as well. <clears throat> but generally, uh, there's this little dip in the breeze here, and I think that's going to, you know, he might pick up some miles, uh, some advantage there. Simon, as we suggested, he's sailed off the edge of the world. <laughs> he's uh, sailed from these trade winds out into nothingness. So at the moment, he's doing two knots. He did 85 miles in the last 24 hours. So he managed to keep up, which is pretty cool. But now he's he's facing the same challenges as uh, Kirsten and, and uh, Abolish. And he's about, you know, I'll go for the, I'll go for break here. We talked about it on the distances. But uh, if we look at uh, what Simon doing, I know he's not in the race, but we're all having a bit of fun with this. Um, he's pretty much about, you know, 150 miles behind on the run line. Oh, maybe from Kirsten, 200, 250, something like that. And because um, the rum line's going up this way. And then they're in a windward position. You know, Kirsten's in a windward position when she hits the trade. So that's an advantage. Um, and uh, Abolish in rum line, well, that's that's fair enough. It's about 300 because, well, it's not, not 300. This is um, the real terms rather than the, than the tracker association. Whoop, sorry. I'm going to get back here so we can see the relevance to Kirsten. 
uh, I'd put it at about there, uh, or a bit more. So what I call real-time rum line distance. Oh, hang on, when I sit back, it's probably I've got to hang back to look at the angles here. It's about there, yeah, 250 miles. That's that's a fair assumption. It's 90 degrees off the rum line, um, and it's saying 250 miles for Abolish. Uh, but see, he's got this little breeze here, so let's just see. Let's just see what happens when we send the weather through. Remembering that the big blue bit in the middle is hard to predict, but this line here of the northeasterly trades versus the southeasterly trades down here, that's a fair representation, okay, of where they really are. But the stuff in the middle is really impossible to predict because that little bit I was saying about uh, giving Abolition an advantage has disappeared. And now there seems to be a little bit of breeze coming up behind for Kirsten uh, to push her along. There's a nice one just here um, where the Simon's going to hook into that, but let's see how long it stays there for. Um, no, it's, no, no, it's a complete mishmash. Uh, oh, Kirsten's got some stuff closest. Yeah, it's a bit it's impossible to predict anything here. We're just going to have to get up in the morning on Sunday morning and rush to the tracker and turn it on and have a look, and then we'll see what's going on because there's really not a lot we can uh, we can do there. Uh, to predict anything and it's the, the good news is it looks pretty fair you know when i say fair they're both going to get something you know kirsten and abolish look as if they're getting something similar um the, you know there's a bit of breeze coming in here and as i always say this is the general trend it's usually the deldrums are usually thinnest to the west on the western side where abolish is here but if kirsten can get across she's in a commanding position because she's to windward so I think that's it. I think we've talked enough for Saturday. And uh, if I come back here, I can switch off. So have a great weekend and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Uh,